Get ready to take a flamethrower to the official narrative and learn what the elites don't want you to know. You're listening to The Tom Woods Show. Everybody, Tom Woods here. It is episode 2542, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by Brian Kaplan. You know him from previous books like uh, The Myth of the Rational Voter, The Case Against Education. I just love that provocative title and a great book. We did an episode on that. He's a professor of economics at George Mason University. And we're going to talk about his most recent book, Build Baby Build, The Science and Ethics of Housing Regulation. Welcome back, Brian. Fantastic to be here, Tom. All right. This is an extremely timely book because if there's one thing you hear being said over and over again by younger people these days, the kind of people just starting out their lives who are you might have been anticipating buying a house sometime down the road, feel like the situation is just hopeless. Like they'll never, ever be able to buy a house in this environment. I think it's driving their attitudes about about life in general. It, it, it's uh, I think it's th- that one ingredient, a- apart from other price inflation, but really housing in particular has led to a feeling of despair among a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, I'd say probably the main thing that's going on is that people feel like, well, I got to live with my parents until I'm 30. That's the only way to go through life, uh, which does obviously have big effects for marriage and fertility and everything else. So, we will, of course, we want to get into what exactly is going on. Like, why are prices so high? Have, have quote, building costs gone up and those have been passed on to the consumer uh, is it? I mean, there are a bunch of possible explanations, but you have a very plausible argument in here that deregulation is would make a substantial dent. In fact, you go so far as to say it's entirely possible that deregulation could cut housing prices by fifty percent. Now, if you can make a case that that's a plausible outcome. You would think that all but the most died in the wool ideologues would say, well, then let's implement it. Yeah. So, by the way, so I do say something stronger than that. I don't give the mealy mouth, oh, it could be possible. I just say that is the best estimate. Best quick estimate is if we did full deregulation of housing, then in, say, 10, 15 years, housing prices would be at about half of where they are now, of course, adjusting for inflation. Uh, Why should we believe this? Well, there's actually been a ton of research over the last 20 years, and you really can see that the main cost of building in the most desirable areas is just getting permission. Like getting permission in San Francisco or New York or Boston or LA, that is up to most of the cost of doing business is getting all that paperwork. It does vary a lot across the country, of course. And if you want to build a skyscraper in the middle of nowhere in Kansas, you probably could. But the whole point of the housing market is to build a lot of housing in places where a lot of people want to live, not to build a lot of housing somewhere. That's the problem. I should say right off the bat that there's something unusual about this book, let's say, as compared to most books that listeners of this podcast might read. I was just telling you over the weekend, I had a number of things I had to read to prep for this week. And I I thought, gosh, I got to read Brian Kaplan's book on housing regulation. But I thought, well, I kind of know a little bit something about that. So- Mm -hmm. That shouldn't take too long. And then I opened it up and realized I, I what I hadn't realized because I got an, an emailed electronic copy um, is that it's actually like it, it's in the form of a graphic novel, except that not is a novel. So That's correct. what made you decide to take that approach? Right. I'm an economic educator and I have noticed that most people don't want to read actual books, which makes me wonder, gee, like how can I actually communicate the wealth of knowledge that researchers have acquired about the world in a way that people actually listen and consume it. I did my first graphic novel with Open Borders on the research on immigration. That one was my first New York Times bestseller, and I decided I wanted to repeat the process with this. I especially like the idea of doing a graphic novel on housing because so many of the objections to housing are aesthetic. It's it, ugly. It's ugly. I don't want to look at that. And then it's like, well, but you don't see it. So how do you know it would be ugly? I wanted to go and draw an alternate world where we have deregulated so that people can just look at at least a vision of what a deregulated world will look like and say, do you really think that looks bad? 
I think it actually looks great. I have uh, one page where I show the actual California coastline and then a deregulated California coastline where you can build a lot of stuff. I think that the one with a lot of construction on it looks better than the actual one. In the same way that if you go to Italy, the most beautiful parts of Italy are not raw nature. It is nature as improved by the hand of man. So that was a big part of what I want to do in the book to show the unseen, which you can do with words kind of, but it's just much better to play Bastiat's what is seen and what is not seen when you've got actual images to bolster the story. Right, right. The, the, the problem, one of the problems I think you recognize in the book is that the word deregulation frightens people. I think in part because <laughs> regulation sounds like somebody's keeping an eye on things and yep. deregulation sounds chaotic to them. And then secondly, I think people have a naive understanding, like an immaculate conception idea of where regulation comes mm -hmm. from, that it's, these are a series of measures that are imposed for the general good by people who are uh, completely disinterested. And I think you do a good job on both. In the first mm -hmm. case, you say, look, I'm not even going to take on regulation per se. Maybe we, you, it, it's possible mm -hmm. you need regulation in some other market. And, and I know that you're winking at us there. <laughs> uh, but, that, but we're just going to focus on housing because the upside to getting rid of these regulations is just so great. But then secondly, let's talk about this. Where these kinds of regulations you're talking about originated in the first place. I mean, mm -hmm. it's possible to imagine that some people were self-interested, but that others genuinely thought they were preventing overcrowding or, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, um, aesthetic monstrosities or whatever. Yeah. I mean, honestly, my take on public choice is that objective self-interest plays a quite marginal role and the real problem in politics is fanaticism. Just people who think they've got the divine revelation of the absolute truth. They don't want to look at any arguments or evidence. They just know for a fact that, for example, there should be parking requirements no matter, at, at any cost. And you know, I, so I know a lot of libertarians, they do like stories, oh, there's some business lobbying for this. Sometimes that's true, but much more often it is groups that think of themselves as do-gooders who just want to go and solve a problem that is trivial at immense cost to the world. And that's what I think most of what's going on when you, when you ask, like, why would anyone support these regulations? A lot of it is just like when people hear a complaint, it's like, we need to do something about it, take decisive action. One example that I heard after the book came out is, got a friend who's a professor in uh, the University of Wyoming in Laramie. So there was a developer who had the land to build 30 new houses. And the local neighbors went to the meeting and complained. And what was the complaint? Light pollution. These houses are going to prevent us from seeing the stars. It's like, all right, well, so like how often do you look at the stars anyway? Couldn't you just drive five more minutes? Do you really have to go and crush an entire housing development project for your stargazing? And then the local government did a compromise. 23 houses can be built. It's like, so seven houses got killed by this ridiculous complaining and that is my main story about what's going on with housing regulation. You know, that combined with the stubborn denial that there's any connection at all between supply and price. Let's try to steel man the arguments of the regulators for, for, for a moment and say, we like single family homes mm -hmm. and uh, we find them attractive. They're, they're very pleasant to live in. And we're afraid that without areas being zoned for single family homes, areas will be so grossly uh, and displeasingly overcrowded that everybody will, will be unhappy. Hmm. I mean, I'd say, I, I wouldn't think of that as the steel man. The steel man would say, all right, look, obviously there's some people who are going to be unhappy, but there's a lot more people who want the regulation than don't, so let's just go with the majority. And you know, like my honest answer there is, first of all, there's a reason why apartments will often beat single family homes, which is just that you're getting a lot more value for your resources out of that. Furthermore, obviously, people really do want to pay more to get the high, to get the higher end thing. They still can in a free market. Really, what regulation does is try to make sure that everybody gets the high end thing. It's kind of like banning used cars. You might say, well, aren't, you know, aren't new cars nicer and cleaner and prettier and more reliable? So, you know, first of all, Maybe not. But anyway, even if that's all true, there's still a really good reason to keep used cars around, which is price. 
people don't want to spend that much money and often with very good reason do they not want to spend that much money. Maybe they don't want to spend it right now. Maybe they will want a single family home in another 10 years, but for now they would like to live in a much cheaper place, which you are preventing the market from providing. Yeah, it's, and of course, for some people, they would just like to have any kind of dwelling whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And the current restriction on supply and therefore the higher prices means they're having difficulty getting anything at all. It's not mm -hmm. like the option is they choose this single family home or this mm -hmm. or that one. The, the choice they have now is between nothing and nothing, at, at least yes. at, at many income levels. Right, or living with your parents is more, is more common. Yep. Um, so like one thing that actually I did learn in writing the book, when I was starting to write the book, I was skeptical that housing regulation was an important cause of homelessness because my view, which is correct, is that people who are actually on the streets just have a lot of behavioral issues. And many of them, if you just gave them money to buy a home, wouldn't spend it on a home. They would spend it on drugs or alcohol. What I learned in writing the book, first of all, kind of knew this, but still was reinforced, is that people that are actually living on the street are a very small share of measured homelessness. It's basically anyone without a fixed address gets classified as homeless. Uh, but secondly, uh, it is unusual even for someone living on the street to be quite that dysfunctional. And the best evidence of this is that single best predictor of homelessness in an area is just the absolute level of rent. It comes down to there's very few people living on the street in, in Mississippi because you have to be really dysfunctional to be unable, unable to afford rent in Mississippi. It's just so cheap. You could spend half your money on alcohol and still the remaining amount would be enough to get you a place to live. So, the, so you put this together and it's like, look, it wouldn't solve all problems of homelessness to deregulate, but really would make a big difference there. And if we have this more expansive definition of homelessness, which is what's usually being put into advocacy statistics, then yeah, of course, it would make a big difference if we could just make it cheaper. A lot of people would stop living on their brother's couch if they could afford their own place easily. We got a lot of broken things in the United States, a whole lot. But surely one of the brokenest is American health care and American health insurance. It's frustrating and expensive. Claims denials are becoming more common. And let me take a wild guess. Maybe something called the Affordable Care Act was misnamed and hasn't actually made your care more affordable. Well, that's why CrowdHealth was created. It's not health insurance. It's a better way to pay for health care through crowdfunding. Because let's face it, your insurance policy is opaque and full of unpleasant surprises. Your premiums are going up every year. You wind up feeling taken advantage of. CrowdHealth is doing things differently. For $175 for an individual or $575 for a family of four or more, you'll get access to a community of people who are willing to help out in the event of an emergency. You'll get access to telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions, and so much more without doctor's networks getting in the way. Let CrowdHealth help with your health care needs. Get started today for just $99 per month for your first three months. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash woods. CrowdHealth is not insurance. Learn more at joincrowdhealth.com slash woods. That's joincrowdhealth.com slash woods. Can you tell, tell us very specifically exactly what do these regulations uh, that are causing these problems consist of? I mean, of course, as we've said, like zoning mm -hmm. uh, and saying that, you know, in this area, you can build a certain way, but it's, it's not just that. Mm -hmm. It's the height. It's the, it's mm -hmm. just the amount of red tape that's involved. It's parking mm -hmm. lots. Yeah. Why don't we just focus on the United States? Cause it does differ quite a bit between countries. Uh, so the United States, so first of all, we've got these very strict restrictions on skyscrapers. For over 100 years, we have had the technology to allow almost anyone who wants to have cheap, spacious housing in the world's most desirable locations just build up. When someone says, well, we can't all live in downtown San Francisco, if we had 100 buildings the size of the Burj Khalifa, we could. And that's not, so that's the starting point. It's, just, it's so hard to build skyscrapers, especially in places where people want to build skyscrapers. Then there are restrictions on multifamily housing, even outside of those most desirable areas. Most land is zoned exclusively for single family. Next is even within single family homes, there are usually high minimum lot sizes for new construction. Like you have to have an acre to build a house, which means that if you've got a 10 acre lot, you could easily build 40 homes there, 40 single family homes, and yet the government will only let you build 10. Then, as you're mentioning, we've got parking regulations. 
Here, it's very standard to require anytime you're building an apartment to say, well, we're going to require you to have two or three parking spaces for every apartment unit. Like, isn't a part of the point of having apartments that you don't need that many cars? Although the, the most egregious case of parking regulation comes from commercial re- regulation, where if you take a look at almost any parking lot in America on almost any day, you'll notice that there's way more spaces than cars. It's like, huh, why is that? Well, the basic parking regulation for commercial real estate in America says that stores must have enough parking spaces for all their customers on the busiest day of the year if they charge zero. So essentially, it's all based on Black Friday. And on Black Friday, if you're going to have 5,000 cars there, then you have to have 5,000 spaces all year long. It's like, well, why can't we just have fewer spaces than charge people on Black Friday? Oh, no, you can't do that. And then actually, if you're stepping back further, I mean, there is an enormous amount of land owned by the federal government and maybe about a third of that, as much as that they owned by state governments. Uh, this is like, it's an incredible share of the country and not just Alaska is owned by government and essentially just kept off the market for the use of some hobbyists and like, maybe some ranchers. But the idea that so much real estate would just be owned by the government in a nominally capitalist country, when you look at the maps, like, my God. And especially what's really striking to me is that you might think, well, the government just owns land nobody else wants. And then you look at the map, it's like, wait a second. Almost all of Texas, including the deserts of West Texas, is privately owned. And you realize what's really going on is the dead hand of Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir when they preach conservation. And then it's all ideology. It's the parts of the country that became states after the ideology of conservationism took off, that's the part, those are the parts where the government owns tons of land and the rest of the country, even places that you might think of as very left wing, there's just very little government land ownership. You know, in, in the midst of all this, there's a, a high profile proposal coming from Kamala Harris about mm-hmm. giving a uh, $25,000 assistance to first time home, buyer, home buyers for a uh, down payment. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there was a George W. Bush policy, the American Dream Down Payment Act or whatever. So this yeah. is a bipartisan thing. Sure. But you're an economist. What is the consequence of implementing a policy like that? Right. The most important thing to understand about the housing market, just like the education market, just like the health market, is the government has two big policies. Policy one, strangle supply. Policy two, pump up demand. Like, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to have low supply combined with really high prices. Of course, so the quality will be low, the price will be high. That's exactly what you should expect. You strangle supply and pumping and pump up demand. And yet, it is so much more popular just to throw money at the problem than to address the fact that you are not letting the industry actually function. I mean, it's worth stepping back and remembering a basic point of Econ 1 which is that there's a difference between the short run and the long run and how markets work. And in the short run, normally when demand goes up, what happens is prices go up, firms make profits, and you look at that, it's like, huh, all right. But what happens in the long run? And the answer is in the long run, when industries are making profits, this provokes new entry, which then drives prices back down. This is the way that housing totally used to work, and now it generally does not, especially in desirable parts of the country. So the key constraint is in fact supply. If we would just go and let the industry build, people would be able to afford homes without those subsidies. And if you keep the industry strangled, all those subsidies do or help some people at the expense of others and without dealing with the basic fact, we don't build anywhere near enough places to live for the number of people that want to live here. Have you looked at all at um, other Western countries and their housing Mm -hmm. policies and what the trend has been in terms of building costs to housing price over the decades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that for rich countries, the U.S. is is about in the middle. Close to the worst is the U.K., where they combine a lot of the same regulations that we have less on the multifamily. Americans are uniquely hostile to multifamily, but then you add on massive green belts, which basically take a lot of what would otherwise be suburban land off the market in the U.K. And then in addition, of course, almost all of Europe is a lot more historic preservation. Japan usually gets scored as one of the best because they have very little historic preservation since the the country was so destroyed in World War II. They just don't have that much history to preserve. 
uh, the, and combined with just lower regulation of tall buildings, things like that. Uh, but the U.S. comes out in about in the middle. We probably have less historic preservation, that, you know, almost definitely less historic preservation than Europe. Um, although even there, don't feel too good about it. Like New York City literally has an historic parking garage. Like, this is where we'll do the field trip with the children to see the first parking garage of this town or the city. Uh, let's look at it. See, children, this is what parking garages once were. Now you know. All right, let's make sure it never gets torn down in order to make sure that other children can learn about parking garages and their illustrious history. Well, yeah, I thought of a valuable point you made um, th that anticipates maybe a, a, an objection you might expect is that I, I don't, it, it, one of the ways you're planning on accommodating parking in what might be a somewhat more populated environment is uh, you got to pay for your parking. Yeah, and, and wow, of, what, a, what an idea. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> you know, you got to, and, and everybody is accustomed, even some, you know, let's say not necessarily leftists, just regular Americans are just accustomed to, well, why should I have to pay for this? Yes. And, to try to get through their heads, but but the price, if you if the price of your house is fifty percent lower, and all you have to do is pay for the odd parking space here and there, it yeah. seems like a pretty good trade off. Yeah, of course. Especially when that's exactly the the way we're doing it now is is distorted in both ways. the the mm -hmm. The price of the housing is distorted upward because of these regulations, and the price of the the parking being free is also a distortion. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to undo those, and the net result is is fantastic. Yes, it's it's very hard to get people to think about net effects. One thing I've noticed in debates is that usually it's very easy to beat me just by listing some downsides of what I'm saying. And the honest answer is, all right, look, you're right on some of those downsides. But if we put a price tag on those downsides, those price tags are quite small. And if we compare it to all the gains, those are a lot larger. Now, as an Austrian, you might immediately be saying, oh, subjective value, who are you to go and put price tags on things? And my answer there is, yeah, subjective value is great, but we don't find out subjective value by listening to what people say. We find out by looking at what they do. Actions speak louder than words. If someone right. says, I would never want to live in a place where you had to pay for parking. It's like, all right, let's see what you actually do when you've got two options. One where housing is 50% cheaper and you have to pay for parking and the other one where it's like now. And you'll see a lot of people will very gladly move over there as measured by their behavior. They may be complaining. But the complaints are not the right way to measure subjective value. Look at demonstrated preference. Right. And of course, Mises says that don't rely on questionnaires. Mm -hmm. you know, people can say anything they want to on a questionnaire. What matters mm -hmm. is at the moment of choice, when yes. the options are before them, what do they actually mm -hmm. do? Yes. And that is, that's what matters. But what about people who say, right now, with the status quo, I'm lucky enough to be a homeowner, and I have a manageable commute to my office. Mm -hmm. But under, you know, if I were to live in Kaplanville with, you know, with maybe larger structures with more families in them uh, or more housing or uh, in one form or another, I'd be, you know, the, the roads would be clogged and I'd be frustrated. Hmm. I mean, my first reaction is say, gee, I wish that everybody that was against new development was like you. Because if this is the way that all people who oppose new development thought, we could solve the problem quite easily. The developers would just open up a suitcase of money and say, what's it going to take to get you to shut up and let me do what I want to do? All right, the real world problem is actually much worse and much stranger than that. There's very little evidence that the main op opponents of housing, uh, of, house, of new housing or the main supporters of regulation are homeowners, people with a lot of financial stake in the status quo. Instead, you'll see that support from homeowners and tenants is similarly high. And if you go and probe further, like, what's the problem? One big part of it is just total economic illiteracy of just refusing to accept that building more housing would reduce prices. It's like, oh, well, but the developers are just going to be all nice and they're going to lower the price of housing just because we let them build more. So like, I'm not saying they're going to be nice. I'm saying that if they build a lot more housing, the only way to get tenants and to sell the units will be to cut the price. Right? And on top of it, just the sheer numeracy of saying, oh, well, you're blotting up my star, so no. There's a lot of that going on too where quite petty complaints get treated as a reason to veto. Uh, right. And obviously, so the people that go to actual land use meetings are some of the very hard to deal with. They're very ideological, very passionate, very self-righteous. And they're hard to bargain with because it's a principle for them. No stars can be blotted out by light pollution. 
I don't care how much you pay me. Right? And those are the people whose democratic participation winds up setting policy to a large degree. Now, I would also say to that homeowner who's thinking about the financial loss, there's actually plausibly big gains to you for deregulation. First of all, do you have a place where a developer would likely want to buy you out for a really high price? If you own your nice town ho home in San Francisco and it's worth $3 million right now, if developers could buy out you and your neighbors and put up a skyscraper, you might be able to get $10 million out of them. So, And what does regulation do? It stops you from selling out to developers. So there's a lot of homeowners who would actually benefit greatly from deregulation. Another one, of course, is what if, you're current, what if you want to upgrade? What if you're in a starter home? If you're in a starter home, do you really want housing prices to be through the roof? It's like, well, that means that I can sell my house for a really high price. But damn it, it also means that I have to buy my new house for a really high price. And if I want to upgrade, that's really bad for me. Be better to have low prices. And then last one, going back to the family point of view, do you want your kids to live within 100 miles of you when they're grown? Well, then what is the point of having really high prices if it means that you can't live anywhere near your kids, your grandkids? If you have to go and take out a loan against the value of your, your inflated value of your house to give your kids the down payment for a house, it's like, well, that's a very odd way of doing it. Wouldn't it be better if just the prices were lower and your kid actually didn't need your help to buy their own house? So I'd say that even this idea that homeowners are clear losers from deregulation is simplistic. Some would lose, but a lot actually would financially gain. It's mostly just a question of if we could get people to think about objective self-interest in a quantitatively serious way instead of just getting angry about stars, what a world it would be. Friends, see if this sounds familiar. It's dinner time, you're busy, you want to eat well, but you're tired. The last thing you want to do is make the kitchen dirty again. Maybe you're missing an ingredient. So then you're just tempted to get on your phone and order Uber Eats and eat food you probably shouldn't eat. And then somehow it's the next day and you're facing the same situation again. And then every day it's again and again and again. Well, Factor is a great solution. You certainly won't get bored. You got over 35 different options a week to choose from to have delivered straight to your door, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie and more. So it's easier than ever to have a week's worth of meals ready to go, no stress. Pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factors restaurant quality meals are ready to heat and eat whenever you are. And by the way, it's not just dinner. You'll discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. Factors restaurant quality meals are less expensive than takeout, and they're much better for you. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. Head to factormeals.com slash woods50 and use code WOODS50 to get 50% off. That's code WOODS50 at factormeals.com slash WOODS50 to get 50% off. Well, think back to 2008 when all of a sudden housing prices were falling. Government officials, I, I, as I recall from both parties, seemed to think that the priority was propping up those prices. Oh, yeah. Instead of saying, oh, hooray, <laughs> now house prices are within reach of people. No, it's, mm -hmm. we want to prop them up and then we'll somehow subsidize the loan that helps you pay mm -hmm. that price and that makes it, quote, affordable. So it is a little bit convoluted. Yeah. I mean, so 2008 is different in that it's just a sudden shocking fall in prices where it also has big effects on the banking system and everything else. Uh, the reasonable thing to expect from deregulation is not that prices fall 50% overnight. Right. It's just that the industry really gears up for a building boom and we just start seeing prices falling by, say, 5 to 10% every year for a while. Um, so, you know, like, there, there is actually, so like one, one argument that people very rarely make, but which is a serious one, is if housing prices fell 50% overnight, wouldn't that bankrupt the entire banking system and mean there'd be another massive bailout and everything else? And so, yeah. Honestly, that's, that's plausible, but that's not the way that even a deregulated market works. We can't go and build 50% more houses in America in a single year. We just don't have the resources. So it would be a gradual float down to a much lower price equilibrium rather than just a sudden overnight shock. You cite in here a number of progressive economists mm -hmm. uh, in defense of your claim that 
deregulation would be beneficial at the very least that regulation has mm-hmm. uh, is uh, in large part responsible for these housing prices and so that includes Matt Iglesias and Paul Krugman uh, and I Herman. guess the idea there is not only is that interesting for us to know but also to to go to show that you can support what I'm saying without having mm-hmm. to give up whatever tribal allegiance you have in our political mm-hmm. system yeah absolutely Look, honestly, when I write something, I'm trying to persuade people who don't already agree with me. And I'm very well aware of a lot of people, if they know anything about me, like, well, I'm not going to listen to that guy. That guy's terrible. <laughs> and so, like, all right, look, all right, maybe I am terrible. Like, let's just grant, for the sake of argument, I'm terrible. Let me find some people that you do trust that are saying the same thing. And then maybe I'm a terrible person who happens to be right on this one issue and you'll keep reading the book. That's what I'm going for. Um, yeah, and you're right. So you know, like, uh, there's like a third of the country are basically committed Democrats. So what are you going to say to them? Turns out actually that if they were aware of what at least Democratic economists thought about this issue, then they would be at least at a relatively very pro market position. Uh, this book is you know, not even thinly veiled a radical libertarian book in the sense that I'm just saying let's take a flamethrower at all these regulations. That's my first choice. I don't hide that. I also say, all right, look, I understand not everybody's going to be on board with that, but it doesn't mean that you should support the status quo. There's still a lot of stuff that people from a wide range of views can agree on if they accept basic economics. Of course, the problem is most people don't. Economic illiteracy is rampant, which, by the way, uh, you might remember, uh, Tom, that we both won prizes, uh, I believe, in 2008. Um, Now, so you won it for your book on... See, was uh, the church in the market. It was yes, about the church in the market. Social right. teaching. Yeah, so I got it for this paper with Ed Stringham on Mises, Bastiat, public opinion, and public choice. The big inspiration there is that for both Mises and Bastiat, economic illiteracy isn't just something that we combat in the classroom. It is the thing that is messing up the planet. It's the thing that is messing up humanity is economic illiteracy. And what I'm doing in Build Baby Build is I'm just trying to go and say, first of all, here's the economically literate way to view the housing market. Second of all, the reason why things are messed up is primarily economic illiteracy. If people would listen to and understand this book, it would solve the problem. But when you say, I want to just set a match to all these regulations, I bet some people might come back at you and say, I'm with you that in, in ways that are direct and indirect, a lot of these regulations are just making us unhappy for gratuitously, and, and, and we'd be well rid of them. But when you say all regulations, surely there must be some basic regulations regarding basic safety uh, mm-hmm. or you know, living space or something that governs the building of houses that surely we wouldn't want to live without those. Right. So what I didn't build, baby build is I focused on the regulations that are doing a lot of harm and where there's a lot of research documenting they do a lot of harm. But yes, I'm totally happy to stick my neck out and say, yes, I totally oppose building codes uh, for two reasons. So what is like, like just start with the regulation you consider totally reasonable. So look, there's still a slippery slope and it's not just a hypothetical, oh, I can imagine things getting bad. Rather, there's an observed slippery slope where the earliest housing regulations were quite mild by modern standards, and you just say, eh, what's the big deal? What is the big deal? So we go and we say that you have to get advanced permission to go and, and open a pig farm. All right. And the answer is, well, it seemed like those regulations were very reasonable, but they did actually metastasize into the garbage that we have today. Because as soon as you create a system where government just says, anyone got any complaints about construction? Anyone not happy with what developers are doing? it does set in motion the system that we have where, yes, I've got complaints, I've got complaints, I've got complaints, and the regulation does just keep expanding. Now, in terms of why I think the regulations are actually bad, you know, even when they sound very reasonable, is the best case, they're mimicking what markets would do anyway. So people don't want to build a skyscraper that collapses. This is not what someone is there saying, well, let's, you know, let's build a skyscraper that collapses. That's crazy. I just don't, when you go and build build that, you want it to be stable. You want it to be reliable. Furthermore, of course, customers are free and routinely would go and have their own inspections. And then if they don't think that we was built to satisfactory standards, guess what? And, they and, don't well, and buy. the insurer. The insurer yes, would want to do Yes, that. and the insurer, of course. Yes. 
Yeah. Right now, on top of all this, I make this uh, this general point. Like all regulation of housing, virtually all, is based upon complaints. So what neoclassical economists will call negative externalities. Now, you can have some philosophical objection to negative externalities, but anyway, I'll say let's just run with it and say, all right, yes, you've li- you've correctly listed a bunch of negative externalities of building housing. Even according to a standard mainstream textbook, that it is totally premature for government to lift a finger because there's something else we have to go and investigate to figure out what the correct, efficient neoclassical policy is, which is, are there any positive externalities? Are there any beneficial side effects on strangers in new construction? And as soon as you say that, say, look, oh yeah, there's a ton. There is, a, you go and move into my neighborhood and then my kids have other kids to play with. There's you go and move into my neighborhood and now my favorite restaurant has enough customers to stay in business. Right? So now this is one where at least you should have an open mind and say, huh, yeah, why is it the regulation is all about trying to second guess development when we haven't even established that the negatives outweigh the positives? It's like, yeah, we have it. Now, more importantly, uh, once again, here we get back to that great Austrian standard of demonstrator preference. We look at the world and we see that there's a lot of people who live in high density areas who complain about how horrible it is. Oh, there's so much traffic in New York. There's the parking problems, there's the noise, blah, blah, blah. And yet they keep living there, even though they are paying a lot more money than they would have to pay to live in a rural area that doesn't have any traffic problems, any parking problems, any noise problems. So, from a demonstrated pro- reference point of view, what can we conclude? It's like, You actually value the package of all the good things that people bring minus all the bad things that people bring as a giant positive. That's why you're there. So your complaining is not giving us the real story. It is your decision to spend your money living there that really shows that you actually think that the net effects of living around other people are positive. I I have to mention toward the end of your book, you have one of my, maybe my favorite part. All right, cool. Let's hear it, Tom. All right. Well, it's where you, you, you explain to, again, I, I hate to say both sides, but yes, but, but, but you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you know, people who fall into this camp or that camp, you, and you, you, you're able to say to them, we all, I think, recognize that affordable housing would be an, a plus, but I don't think we recognize just how much of a plus it is mm-hmm. in terms of things that matter very much to you and things that matter very much to you and so you, uh, you talk about inequality and a bunch of other things that might mm-hmm. resonate on the, the left. And then on the right, you're saying fertility and a, and a whole bunch of other things. And, um, and, and incidentally, in parentheses, I think a, a factor that you put in the book that most people wouldn't think of is because of the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the dramatic rise in housing prices in particularly high-paying parts of the country, mm-hmm. it's been much harder for people of lower incomes to relocate to get that better job yes, yes. because the fruits of the better job are just eaten up by the excess that's in right. housing costs. And it was not always so. Uh, you, you're you're enough of a story to know this was not the way that labor and housing markets used to work. It used to be the housing prices were much more similar across the country, even though some areas were higher paying. So you really could just pack up your car and drive to a high wage area of the country and pocket the difference. So, so there were, in other words, there are things that maybe if you haven't thought about it very much, are benefits, you know, again, that would, wouldn't have occurred to you unless you'd really sat down and mm-hmm. given it some thought. So I don't want to take away the, 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 the fun, dramatic, uh, not quite conclusion of the book, but certainly conclusion of the argument in a way. Mm-hmm. But yet I still would like it if you could take a minute and, and like uh, maybe make the, the elevator pitch for the left or the elevator pitch for the mm-hmm. right super quick about ways in, in which things would be improved beyond just the obvious of the prices of houses coming down. Sure thing, Tom. All right, so for the left, it comes down to this. Look, housing is a necessity, which means that the poorer you are, the larger a share of the income you spend on it. So not only will deregulating housing put prices of housing down, but a especially large share winds up going to the poor because they wind up spending a larger share of their income on housing. This means that we've got lower inequality. We have especially large gains for the poor. And then, yes, on top of that, like I was saying, in the current system, it is really hard for someone who 
is lower skilled to just move to get a better paying job and profit from it because housing prices are so high in those more desirable locations. So yeah, I would focus on that for the left and then begin for the right. Saying, look, a lot of the reason why people keep living with their parents, meaning they don't get married, meaning they don't have kids, is it's just too expensive to get your own house. If it well, we could get that price down, then we really could get fertility up. Uh, so again, least least my favorite kind of right winger wants fertility. So right. <laughs> so yes, we got that. And then you know, on top of it, of course, there's all especially a lot of right wing concern for working class males. Uh, you know, it's like the poor is left, whereas working class males is right. But anyway, uh, who builds almost all housing in America? You know, working class males. So these are relatively high paid jobs for working class males. Like that describes a large majority of people work in the industry. Never mind, of course, they're the ones who also are likely to be living in these cheaper houses too. Well, it's a it's a very compelling book, and as we noted earlier, because of the format, it can be consumed quickly and its mm-hmm. arguments absorbed readily. Yes, so, and it, you it, can be and kids, you know, five year olds can read the book. They won't understand everything, but I've definitely had very young kids who read the whole book and enjoyed it. So no doubt, my, no doubt. And as yeah. time goes on, they appreciate it on ever higher levels. You know, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I, so in a way, I'm trying to go for the whole range from Tuttle Twins up to Human Action. And the, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, re- in readership. one book, yes, that is one something book. else. So you're going to yeah. have to see this for yourselves, folks. And you can do that uh, by, I'll have a link to the, the book in the video description, but also on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 2542 for episode number 2542. Well, Brian, thanks so much. Very enlightening very and important much. work you're doing. All right. So, uh, great pleasure as always talking to you, Tom. Bye-bye. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Make yourself and those you love less vulnerable to the regime, both mentally and physically. Get more forbidden information at tomsfreebooks.com and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. See you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.